Welcome to the 2013 University Lecture. It's wonderful to have all of you here this evening, and I think we're going to have just a spectacular time. I have the pleasure this evening of introducing our speaker, Dr. Michael F. Hollick. One cannot pick up a newspaper or a magazine or log into a news site without encountering articles that report on the latest f research findings on some aspect of human health or nutrition. If you follow such news, you will have likely encountered Dr. Hollick and his work. For more than four decades, his research has explored the role of vitamin D in human health, the mechanisms by which it acts within the body, and the role of sunlight in contributing to our levels of vitamin D and in turn to our well-being. This last aspect of Dr. Hollick's research writing and public speaking has, as you might have read, generated some controversy. For many years now, we have been admonished to cover up, to wear sunscreen, and avoid overexposure to sunlight because of the risk of developing sun can uh, skin cancer. And you know that many people take this to an extreme. The issue turns on the definition of overexposure. Dr. Hollick, as he will discuss shortly, has found that some exposure to sunlight is essential in order to allow the body to manufacture vitamin D, to generate to generations of our parents who have kept their children in virtual cocoons and the physicians who encouraged them to do so, this sounded like medical heresy. The story of how Dr. Hollick came to his conclusions and worked to find the right balance between exposure to sunlight and protection of the skin is a fascinating tale of medicine and science, a wonderful example of translational research in a measure of the complexity of medical research in the advice we receive from our physicians. Michael Hollick received a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry, I love chemists, from Seton Hall University, a Master of Science degree and his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin, and his MD degree also from the University of Wisconsin. After completing his internship and residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, he's held he held academic and clinical appointments at Harvard Medical School, MIT, and Tufts Medical School before coming to Boston University School of Medicine in 1987. Today, he is a professor of medicine, physiology, and biophysics, the Emeritus Chief of Endocrinology, Nutrition, and Diabetes, Director of the General Clinical Research Unit, and at the Boston Medical Center, the Director of the Vitamin D Skin and Bone Cancer Research Laboratory. His research output is prodigious. With more than 430 peer-reviewed publications, that makes me tired just thinking about it, <laughs> nearly 220 reviews and book chapters, 13 books that he has written or edited, and hundreds of ground rounds and keynote addresses around the world. As you might well imagine, Dr. Hollick has been recognized with numerous awards and honors throughout his career, ranging from the PISA Medallion for Excellence in Science to the Linus Pauling Functional Medicine Award and the Linus Pauling Prize. The Linus Pauling Prize. The American Nutrition Society presented him with its 2011 Communication Media Award, and he has appeared on several best doctors' lists. Friends, colleagues, and students, I am honored to present the 2013 University Lecturer, Dr. Michael Hollick, who will speak on the delightful vitamin D for health. Dr. Hollick. Well, thank you for that wonderful and kind introduction. And I'm truly overwhelmed by all the people that are in the audience, so many family and friends. And I want to especially thank uh, Dr. David Center for um, uh, having me as being considered for this award. And then I was very pleased when I heard from Dr. Morrison by snail mail that took about four weeks that I was actually chosen to be this year's lecturer. Now, it turns out that when I was asked what I think about all this, I couldn't think of anything but simple word. And in fact, thank you very much. And so, it almost makes me speechless. But obviously, being a lecturer, that's not particularly a good thing to be in a position to do. And so it turns out that um, I'm going to be talking about the delightful vitamin D for health. And one of the issues I'm sure that Dr. Brown is thinking about, as you are, is 
Did you, why did you choose vitamin D? And why did you spend 40 years of your life in this field? Well, it turns out that because I had this varied audience with varied experience, I knew that I needed to seek higher counsel. And so I decided to go to a doctor that I think you all know and respect for his wisdom and how kind he is. And I think with the wonderful modern IT that's here at BU, I think I've gotten him to just say a comment. You're an idiot. Right. <laughs> right? Indeed, Hollick, you're an idiot, right? Because what am I going to tell you about vitamin D that you don't already know about? Well, hopefully there's a few things. People worry these days about conflict of interest, so I get support from NIH and the UV Foundation, and I consult for a variety of companies, none of which conflict with this talk. But much to the dismay of the dermatology community, I get support from the sun. And indeed, you can go to this website, drhollick.com, for more information about vitamin D. So I'm going to take you on a 40 plus year journey that I've taken over um, these four decades in the field of vitamin D. And as you've heard from Dr. Brown, it started out at Seton Hall University where I graduated with a BS in chemistry in 1968. But even at that time, as I was really interested in organic chemistry, I wanted to understand biochemistry and microbiology. And I went off to the University of Wisconsin in 1968 as a graduate student in microbiology. But I realized quickly that they were interested in counting plaques, and I was interested in understanding the biochemistry of microbes. So I decided to go to the Department of Biochemistry and tell them, look, I've been accepted to the graduate program at the University of Wisconsin, so therefore you should accept me in the Department of Biochemistry. And believe it or not, they bought it. And so in 1969, I entered the Department of Biochemistry. Now, I'm a, bio, I'm a chemist. I am not a biochemist. I had no biochemistry experience. And I was already there now, basically, uh, with the other students. They, they were there for a year taking biochemistry. And I was interested in becoming a physician scientist, right? And so I was asked to choose a research mentor. And I'm sure a lot of students in the audience, you're always thinking about this, right? And you always want to be, of course, in the cutting edge research. Well, back in the 1960s and 70s, it was, how do mitochondria use food to generate um, energy? And of course, Crick and Watson had just identified DNA. So I was keen to work with someone in one of these areas of interest. But of course, there were no openings. And so indeed, I was told, join the D team, right? Because they had an opening. And I said, oh my god, I can't think of a more boring subject than vitamin D. Why would I want to work in vitamin D? Well, it turns out that as I arrived in 1969, and since I was in the, basically the first year of class, I had to take a prelim, but I never had biochemistry. Well, when I took it, I didn't do very well. And so my mentor calls me up and he says to me, Michael, you should be taking an easier program. In fact, he suggested that if you decide to stay, you're gonna have to get a master's degree. It's gonna take you about three years. And then, if you want your PhD degree, another four to five years. So he didn't want to be discouraging, right? But it's six to eight years to complete the program. I said, I'll do it. And so this was the issue. Why does it take 24 hours for vitamin D to work? If you take a vitamin D deficient animal and give them vitamin D, it took 24 hours to stimulate intestinal calcium absorption. And so there's typically what happens, is that intestinal calcium absorption begins to rise at 12 hours and peaks at about 24 hours. So the possibilities are slow acting, maybe it needs activation, maybe it's simply a dumb vitamin, right? And so is vitamin D activated? Well, how do you figure that out? Well, it turns out that the, the decision was made by Hector DeLuca's group is that maybe you should be giving pigs a lot of vitamin D. So Lord of the Pigs. And so the strategy was to take pigs, give them pharmacologic doses of vitamin D and collect the blood. Now, certainly when you look at your textbooks in medicine and you see all of these nice metabolic pathways, you don't really appreciate how it's accomplished. And so, in fact, pigs were fed lots of vitamin D, and then what you had to do, of course, was to slit their throat and collect the blood, right? And so we now knew that pigs made 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So as I arrived in 1969, they had realized that pigs getting pharmacologic doses of vitamin D converted it to 25-hydroxy D. But the skeptics said, who cares? These are pigs, right? And number two is that they were getting huge amounts of vitamin D. So how do you know this makes any sense at all? So it turns out that Lou Avioli, who's kind of the guru, father of bone health in St. Louis University, 
asked the big question, what about in humans? And it turns out that unlike what you could do today, that he had patients with hypoparathyroidism. And the way to treat them back then was to give them pharmacologic doses of vitamin D, just like they were giving to the pigs. And he was bleeding his patients, and he was keeping the blood in his freezer at home. And he calls up DeLuca and he says, would you like to have some blood? And so they decided that since I had to get my master's degree, why don't you give it a holic? And what you do is you follow the exact procedure of pig blood, and you'll get your master's degree in one to two years. <laughs> and so I started in July of 1969, and November of 1969, after working about 12 hours a day, seven days a week, I realized there's a lipid contaminant that you couldn't separate by standard chromatography techniques. All techniques had been exhausted. On Thanksgiving Day, I was so depressed, I went into, into the lab, and I was amazed to see on the shelf, just caught my eye, was what's called Cephadex OH20. Now, I had not a clue what this was, but what I did remember from my college days was that Cephadex, which you would use like in your biology lab, which would separate things based on size, so that you get these nice pretty colors that are, are being separated in a laboratory, that you would separate things based on size. So I decided, why not? Why don't we try this? So I poured a column, but I didn't know what to use. Well, we typically use hexane and chloroform. I made a 50-50 mixture, just thinking, why not? And I poured the column, and two hours later, I had purified the major circulating form of vitamin D in human blood and completed my master's thesis. So, isolated and identified 20 oxy D started in July and ended November 1969. <laughs> and so we published some of this data. So developed, it turned out, was not separating it based on size, which I originally thought. I actually had developed a novel liquid gel chromatography system that became the gold standard for measuring and uh, separating vitamin D metabolites for the next decade and then I received my master's degree when they gave it out in January of 1970. So now we knew. When you're exposed to sunlight, you make vitamin D, goes to your liver, converted to 25-hydroxy-D, major circulating form. Everybody thought this was the active form of vitamin D. It made sense. And in fact, if you give 25-hydroxy vitamin D compared to vitamin D, it only now took 12 hours to maximize intestinal calcium absorption. But the question is, is 12 hours still too long? Maybe it need, still needed to be activated. And did this activation occur in the target tissue? Because if you took radioactive 25-hydroxy-D and gave it to a vitamin D-deficient animal, instantly a more polar compound appeared in the intestine. So, and the intestine is, of course, the target tissue. So it made good sense that the intestine uses 25-hydroxy-D to convert it to the active form so that it can work where it's supposed to. And so was it activated? And so, the, several laboratories were interested in kind of the holy grail in the vitamin D field. Who would be the first to identify the active form of vitamin D? Tony Norman's group at the University of California and Egon Kogancheck out at Cambridge University and of course Hector DeLuca's lab all were in hot competition to be the first to structurally identify the active form of vitamin D. So the strategy in DeLuca's group was simple, which was take more pigs, feed them a lot of vitamin D, and get lots of the active hormone. Well, it turns out this is, of course, what you have to do to collect the intestine. But what's really great about this is graduate students are always hungry, right? And in fact, they like to be fed. So guess what we did with these pigs? We learned how to butcher them. And so we wound up storing all these pigs in freezers all over uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and we were eating like kings and queens for the next year. And so we were learning how to butcher pigs very nicely. But it failed, all right? Why? Because it's likely that you're not going to make an active form of vitamin D in huge amounts. If it's active, that's because the body wants to make a tiny amount and to be able to conserve it. Otherwise, it would make you probably toxic. So then the thought process was, well, ah, what we really need are intestines from animals that normally get a physiologic amount of vitamin D. Well, what you would do? Well, chickens sound like a good choice. And so it turns out that why not 
get a lot of intestines. Now, where are you going to get a lot of chicken intestines? Well, there's only really one place to go. It's to a slaughterhouse. One hour drive north of Madison, Wisconsin, was the Break Bush Slaughterhouse. They slaughtered 20,000 chickens a day. And so we wound up getting 20,000 chickens processed, collected 400 pounds of intestine. So here I am with Bob <laughs> Cousins collecting these guts as they're coming down the end. And Hector DeLuca outside cleaning all the sika and everything else out of the guts. One of them got away, so we had a little uh, party here and uh, kept them as a mascot. So we now had 400 pounds of intestine. Now normally, you know, you don't really think about these things. Normally when you do an experiment, you take one chicken and you take one intestine and you do your extraction and your chromatography. Well, what do you do with 400 pounds? We never thought about that. Because, you know, you use like maybe 15, 20 mLs of chloroform. Well, what do you do with 400 pounds? And first of all, how do you begin to grind up 400 pounds? Well, it turns out in the basement that they had a sausage maker. And so these 400 pounds of chicken intestine we put through the sausage maker. And it also turns out that the University of Wisconsin is well known for fermentation back in the 1930s. So they had these huge stainless steel vats. So we decided to dump these 400 pounds of ground up chicken intestine in these vats and poured in hundreds of gallons of methanol chloroform. Now you see this room in the basement? There is no ventilation. We all became chloroform intoxicated, <laughs> right? And then we had to figure out, well, how do you dry down 400 gallons of chloroform? Nobody had a clue. And so there was an orange juice maker there. And so we figured an orange juice concentrator. Hmm, that sounds good. So we dumped some in and we turned it on and it was starting to work. We thought it was great. Then everything turned black. The chloroform dissolved all of the gaskets in the machine. <laughs> and so finally, we were able to get it and we put it on one of the columns that I had developed called Cephadex OH20. And this is the typical old fraction collectors that we used. Failed. All right, why? Well, it turns out that if you give even 100 units, and these chickens normally being fed, they're getting hundreds of units of vitamin D a day, Right? If you use silicic acid chromatography, the standard type of chromatography, this peak five, which looks very nice and clean, right? if you put it on my Cephadex column, which is what we did, it turned out that it's multiple compounds and that this tiny one right here was the one that we wanted. So we knew this wasn't going to work. So we do not have a lot of active vitamin D, right? And so the question is, any thoughts? Well, in July, I thought of a crazy idea, and that is, new strategy. Why not take vitamin D deficient chickens, and why not give them a physiologic dose of radioactive vitamin D? By doing so, right, the chicken has no vitamin D. So the stuff that you give, you now will be able to find in the chicken, and you will be able to know exactly how much you have. Well, that all sounds great, but now you have to do a calculation because every chick intestine contains seven nanograms. Nanograms, we're talking about like one millionth of a grain of sand. And I figured I needed 10 micrograms minimum to be able to even begin to think about successfully identifying this thing. And so I did the calculation, I figured I needed 1,500 chicken intestines. <laughs> now how do you get 1,500 vitamin D deficient chicken intestines? Well, you have to grow vitamin D deficient chickens. And so that's what we did. So in July of 1970, as Bob Cousins was working on his 400 pounds of chicken intestine, I was growing 500 chickens at a time. And six weeks later, guess what? Happily, a postdoc, Jack Umda, in the lab is masterful chicken man. And he knows how to inject the wing vein of chickens. So we injected every one of these 500 chickens with 10 international units of physiologic dose of radioactive vitamin D. And I started collecting these intestines. So I had now two batches. So I had 1,000 intestines in the freezer. But I knew I needed 1,500. And all of a sudden, 10 PM, November 15, 1970, BBC, Kodachek's Cambridge group made a major discovery for vitamin D. Oh my god, <laughs> right? So I come in the next morning, and there's Hector DeLuca, and he says, we need to start now. And I said, but I only have 1,000 chicken intestines. I need 1,500. And he said, guess who's the mentor here? <laughs> start tomorrow. So I said, fine. So I went to the lab, and I started to 
at 7 o'clock in the morning thawing these things, and he came in at 10, 8 o'clock and he said, Hollick, you've been right in the past. Why don't you wait for your other 500 chicken intestines? So I did. And so in December 1st, 1970, 1,500 intestines after we ground them up and extracted them, that's what it looked like. And then I started to chromatograph them. And then Christmas came. And so I flew home for Christmas. I wished my parents a Merry Christmas, and I got back on the plane the next day and started doing more chromatography, because I said, we're in hot competition, especially with the Cambridge group. We think that they may have beaten us, and my PhD is going to go down the drain. We got to get this done. So they wished me well, and I'm back in Wisconsin. And 17 chromatographies later, right, this is my PhD, so I never left the fraction collector. I collected every one of these things by hand, and I had 90% of the material by the time I had finished 17 chromatographies. And so Heinrich Snows is in the biochemistry department. He's the mass spectroscopist. And so he performed mass spectroscopy January 2nd, 1971. And the good news was, ah, failed. And it turned out that I had eight micrograms of metabolite left. I had 10 micrograms I knew, right? And by this time, after 17 chromatographies, I still had eight micrograms. But I had 200 micrograms of junk. I had 8% purity. This ain't going to work. And so now DeLuca and Schnoes, they were beside themselves. They said, this is it. We failed. The Kodachek group has got it. End of story. So I said, whoa, whoa. Let's wait a minute. I said, I can't believe that Mother Nature would be so nasty that any contaminant would have the same hydroxyl groups in the same position. We knew vitamin D had a secondary hydroxyl group at carbon-3. We knew there was a 25-hydroxyl group, and that's a tertiary. right? And remember, organic chemistry days, tertiary hydroxyl groups are not as reactive. So what if you TMS silylated all three of them and then carefully desilylate them to only remain this one, and therefore change the polarity, and possibly recover the trimethylsilylated derivative of, of the active form. That sounded great to Hector DeLuca and to Henry Snows. And so, as a result, they said, do it. But, ah, we can't do that, because I mean, this stuff is precious. So let's just do a tiny experiment. So we took one hundredth of a sample, and I trimethylsilylated it. And then to desilate it, you have to add a little bit of hydrochloric acid. I did it. Gave it to Heinrich Snows, put it in a mass spec, got a 50-50 mixture. It sounded great. And then I said, oh, wait, we better do it again. We, you know, this is science. We just gotta do it. So I did it again. And now I got a 1090 mixture. Well, they were a little bit depressed. But they said, oh, let's wait. We'll do it one more time. So I did it one more time, and I got just the opposite. So they said, Hollick, this is not alchemy, right? This is science. And I said, OK. I got so distressed, I went upstairs. I dumped in the hydrochloric acid. I prayed over it and put it on my column. And two hours later, I had identified the active form of vitamin D. And so it turns out that Kodachek had published, submitted their paper, February 19, 1971. We submitted our paper February 12, 1971 by going home for Christmas for that one day made all the difference because we were the first to structurally identify the active form of vitamin D seven days before Kodachek's group did. As a result, Worf patented it, and as a result, generated tens of millions of dollars in patent royalties as a result of me going home for one day to say Merry Christmas to my parents. And so I received my PhD, 1971. And so what was happening on BBC? It turned out, interestingly, that it was published. Dummies, it's the kidneys that activate vitamin D. Apparently, a graduate student got so frustrated because what made real sense was why not just take intestines, incubate them with vitamin D, and get the active form? It's a lot easier than trying to give 1,500 chickens vitamin D. And it never worked. So I think this graduate student got frustrated. So he just took the whole animal apart and he incubated everything and found that the kidneys did it. Total surprise. But that's important because we always knew that kidney failure patients had a resistance to vitamin D and had bone disease. And now all of a sudden the light was turned on. We now understood why patients with kidney disease had bone disease. They couldn't activate vitamin D. 
And so now we knew that when you looked at activated vitamin D after only six hours, you maximize intestinal calcium transport compared to 25-hydroxy D and compared to vitamin D. So we knew that we had the active form of vitamin D. And so now we knew that once you make vitamin D in your skin, goes to your liver, activated to 25-hydroxy D, major circulating form that your doctors order when you go to the doctor for your vitamin D level, and then to the kidney where it gets activated to the active form of vitamin D. But you know how mentors are? They're never happy. And so, yep, we had a nice party and we were successful, but then he said we had to synthesize it. And it turns out that my roommate, working for Heinrich Schnoes, was an organic chemist as well. And he was tasked to do the synthesis. And I was tasked to help him do it. But in typical fashion, of course, what you do is you go to all the world's authorities, right? And so Dr. Barry Trost and E.J. Corey at Harvard, they were all asked to give synthetic methods to produce the active form of vitamin D. And we were given those methods, we tried them, and none of them really worked. And so Eric Semler, my roommate was responsible for the first half of the synthesis. And so he was merrily going along and then stopped right here because we couldn't figure out how to go on any further. Well, what to do? Well, it turns out that what you can do is, I saw on Heinrich Snow's library a book, Feaser and Feaser, Reagents for Organic Chemistry, all reagents known at the time, this massive volume of over a 1,000 pages. So I sat down one night, and I started paging through it. And on page 879, I saw a reaction that looked like it would work. And I tried it, and it did. And so now, I was responsible for the second half, which we then did. And it was phosphorus oxychloride reaction that helped us get to the end of the pathway. And so as a result, we not only made the active form of vitamin D, but its analog, the 25-hydroxy uh, that was missing. And so we made the active form of vitamin D as well as its 1-alpha-hydroxy analog. 21-step synthesis started with a kilogram of material, right? We wound up 1.5 years later with two milligrams, right? But he was happy because he's a renal failure patient, right? And it turned out, Yay, no more bone pain, because the stuff that we made in the laboratory, we, back then the FDA wasn't overly burdensome. We would simply work it up, dissolve it up in a little bit of, of alcohol and mineral oil. We gave it to these patients, and they were doing fantastic, right? And so 1-alpha-hydroxy-D was then sent around, the stuff that we had made in the test tube, to many clinicians around the world, as well as 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. Finally, drug companies started making this, approved by the FDA. Millions of kidney failure patients now use these medications on a daily basis to help prevent metabolic bone disease. So now we knew, once vitamin D is made in your skin, liver, and then it's activated. So in 1972, as a medical student, I was a full-time postdoc because I was so enjoying my research in Hector's lab. And no offense to Dr. Antman, who's in the audience, medical school is really boring. And so I decided I really enjoyed being in the lab. And so from 1970 to 1975, published about 44 papers and 14 reviews, and headed off to Harvard. I moved with my wife, Sally Ann, to Massachusetts, not knowing if I could really do this, and I called up my friends at the BI and at Mass General, and I said, would you mind if I did a rotation or two at your hospital? Not telling Harvard University that I'm actually going to be doing all my rotations at Harvard Medical School. And I was also asked by Dr. John Potts, endocrine chief at Massachusetts General Hospital, how would you like to join our endocrine team? So as a fourth year medical student, I set up a vitamin D lab. And then I was asked to become an MGH resident and I maintained my vitamin D lab at the same time. And so vitamin D, of course, is the sunshine vitamin. And so I was interested in knowing when was vitamin D first made, how is it made in the skin, what factors influence its production, does it have other health benefits? So the first question I asked was, early in evolution, when life forms first appeared on this earth, exposed to sunlight, were they making vitamin D? And so, being, of course, at the world's greatest hospital, right, and I, had, I, I was being recruited to stay there, right, and so Dr. Potts said, sure, we'll help you with a phytoplankton biology lab. Well, it didn't work out as I had hoped, right? 
And so we went to Woods Hole and we grew an organism, Emiliani huxleyi. It's existed in the Atlantic Ocean, unchanged for 500 million years. And when we exposed this organism to sunlight, bingo, it made vitamin D. So vitamin D is like the oldest hormone on this earth. So you may wonder why. Well, if you think about this evolutionarily, it makes sense. Right, because as organisms evolved in the ocean, they started developing skeletons, and so they probably needed vitamin D for their skeletons. Well, they actually didn't, because there's plenty of calcium in the ocean. They could simply suck the calcium out of their bath and put it to their skeleton. But 350 million years ago, life forms became bored with the ocean. They left on for terra firma. They were confronted with a problem. Right, there's no calcium on land. Right? Indeed, they certainly need a lot of calcium for their skeletons. So reasons that we don't fully understand, it was exposure to sunlight on the skin, permitting them to efficiently absorb their dietary calcium. But 65 million years ago, there was a blip in evolution when the asteroid hit the Earth. I argued, of course, that the dinosaurs disappeared because it was too cold. They didn't have enough food. Well, that may be true, but I tell you what, vitamin D deficiency would have gone up first. Now, you may think that that's silly, except that it's actually the nocturnal rodent that survived that Holocaust, and they did not need vitamin D to survive. So now, if you put this into perspective, it makes sense. <laughs> And don't forget the calcium. You got it. So we're an amphibian, reptile, avian species, lower primate. We've always depended on sun for our vitamin D requirement. So I wonder about these dark-haired Neanderthals. How are they going to survive in a northern European climate? And it turns out that their DNA has shown that they were actually red-headed Celtic. The driver in evolution for depigmentation is clear. This is the pelvis of a normal female. This is the pelvis of a female that had rickets her in utero in her first few years of life. She would have had a difficult, if not impossible, time with childbirthing. So within a few generations, pigmentation had to have devolved in order for humans to have migrated north and south to the equator. Now we had showed many years ago that you can't make any vitamin D in Boston in wintertime. So I took my daughter Emily on safari to Kenya. I thought we'd make some vitamin D, write it off on our taxes as a medical expense. That doesn't work. But I tell you what, this Sambora warrior, he's perfectly designed for his environment. So how do you really compare and contrast? There's no question my gene pigment devolved <laughs> in order for me to make enough vitamin D. So how do you make it? Well, it turns out that it's the precursor of cholesterol in your skin, absorbs ultraviolet radiation, ultimately converting it to vitamin D. So you may wonder, if you're using a statin and has some impact on cholesterol biosynthesis, is it going to affect your skin's ability to make vitamin D? The answer is no. Statins don't get into the bloodless epidermis. Now, she's a lot of bad habits, a lot of worries. But one thing you never have to worry about, you will never make too much vitamin D from sun exposure. Because we showed many years ago, any excess is destroyed by the sun. You cannot become toxic. Now, he's, of course, the poster child for sun exposure, right? But it's true that when you're exposed to sunlight, it lasts two to three times longer in your body than when you take it as a supplement. But for humans, the story begins with the Industrial Revolution. These kids in these alleyways, ex not exposed to any sunlight, develop classic rickets, growth retardation, skeletal abnormalities. It was a Polish physician in 1822 who realized that kids that lived in Warsaw had a high incidence of rickets, and the kids that lived in the rural areas outside of Warsaw didn't. And so it was strong and obvious the influence of sun on the cure of rickets and the currents of the disease in densely populated towns where the streets were narrow and poorly lit. Sinedeki, 1822. Who's going to believe a Polish physician in 1822? It would take 100 years to appreciate that observation. In fact, two physicians finally in 1921 took some children, put them on a roof of New York City hospital, and cured rickets. This led to a novel concept. 1931, our government set up an agency telling you to put your children outside to get some sensible sun exposure, to prevent them from getting rickets. But as you've heard from Dr. Brown, it's true. For 40 years, unchallenged, they've been the dermatologist telling you never to be exposed to direct sunlight. If you ever put your child outside without a sunscreen, you could wind up on America's most wonderful child abuse. <laughs> this is the problem. 
right? There's essentially no vitamin D in your diet. Cows don't put vitamin D in your milk. It was Harry Steenbach in Wisconsin who realized if you can irradiate people and animals, why not irradiate the food? That led to the magic vitamin D Steenbach process, eventually the fortification of milk. It eradicated rickets as a significant health problem in the United States and Europe. We don't see rickets commonly. We are not thinking about vitamin D deficiency. But vitamin D is critically important for bone health, right? Indeed, whether you're a rodent or a puppy or a cow or a chicken, they all need a source of vitamin D. So I thought I'd bring you a couple of cases that you may not typically have heard about, although this is a very uh, a case that you've heard about in the press, it got a lot of publicity. Seven-month-old female, muscle weakness, seizures, and a calcium half normal. Well, it turns out that it's the first lowland gorilla born at the Franklin Zoo, Kamani, to mom, and about to die. And a pediatrician saw the infant, gave 400 units of vitamin D, didn't do any good. Pediatrician concluded, must be some rare genetic disorder, and wished the caretakers good luck. Well, the infant's complaining to mom, and dad's upset. In fact, if you ever wondered what he was trying to say, what he was trying to say. And so that's indeed what they did. They called me, and I got to see the infant. Infant has classic rickets of the wrist. And so how do you treat? You treat aggressively. So I gave the infant 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. In fact, I was the guest of honor for her first birthday. But what's the message here? Mommy, will my growth be stunted? If you go to the Franklin Zoo and see her, her growth is permanently stunted because of in utero and her first few weeks of life of vitamin D deficiency. We estimate still today more than 50% of infants that are born are born in a deficient or insufficient state. Indeed, I'm not sure what Brittany here is thinking about, but I'll tell you what she should be thinking about. Is she at risk of vitamin D deficiency? Indeed, we did a study at our medical center and looked at 40 mother-infant pairs and measured their vitamin D status. 70% were taking a multivitamin, two glasses of milk a day, getting 600 units of vitamin D a day. This is the amount that's recommended by the Institute of Medicine for all pregnant women. At the time they gave birth, 76% of moms, 81% of newborns were vitamin D deficient. Why should you care? Because we went on to show that preeclampsia, one of the most serious complications of pregnancy, was associated with vitamin D deficiency. Who are they? These are three children born by cesarean sectioning back in 1889. C-sectioning became popular because of rickets. Women had a difficult time with childbirthing. And so they were born healthy, but they wound up with severe growth retardation because they still had vitamin D deficiency rickets. And so we did a study at our hospital, because also vitamin D is critically important for muscle function, which of course is important for the birthing action. And sure enough, when we looked at over 200 women giving birth, they had a 400% reduced risk of requiring a C-section if they simply were vitamin D sufficient at the time that they gave birth. So I'm not sure what Christine here is thinking about, but we're telling all pregnant women they should be on 2,000 units of vitamin D a day on top of their prenatal vitamin and drinking three to four glasses of milk a day. This tells us evolutionarily how much vitamin D we all need. It makes no sense that human breast milk should not have enough vitamin D. It must mean that our hunter-gatherer forefathers outside every day were making thousands of units of vitamin D a day. So a study was done by Bruce Hollis down in South Carolina. If you give lactating women 4,000 units of vitamin D a day, she finally puts enough in her milk to satisfy her infant's requirement. This is the amount we think that we all need. Pediatricians have been paranoid about vitamin D because we've all been taught vitamin D is one of the most toxic, fat-soluble vitamins. But even the American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends all infants from the time they're born deserve 400 units of vitamin D a day. In Canada, up to 800 units a day. Pregnant and lactating women, 2,000 units a day. One-year-old female, muscle weakness, bony deformities, failure to thrive. This is a major problem for young in the United States. 750,000 young. So is the Jurassic Syndrome. It's all because of Steven Spielberg and Jurassic Park. Well, for the nutritionists in the audience to appreciate that crickets and lettuces are not a healthy diet. It's not because of people eating crickets, it's because of iguanas. Because of Jurassic Park, the kids want to have a pet dinosaur. What better animal to have than a pet iguana? But iguanas are like human beings. They need a source of calcium and vitamin D, but they're also herbivores, and they're fed a steady diet of lettuce. And they wind up with osteoporosis and osteomalacia. They fracture the rib cages, their long bones, they fall off their perches, and they die. 
My nine-year-old daughter, Emily, went to see Jurassic Park with me, and she wanted a pet iguana. Well, I could have a pet iguana die of a calcium and vitamin D deficiency. So what do you do? You keep up with the literature. And I'm sure that Dr. B. Brown, keeping up with the reptile literature, back in 1997, metabolic bone disease, this is what happens when you're vitamin D deficient. Now I always like the response from the audience, show a patient like that, nobody cares. But you'll remember this, <laughs> vitamin D deficiency increases risk of vertebral fractures, as well as non-vertebral fractures. And how do you get your patients to take your calcium every day? Well, just like for her iguana, right, wouldn't, take Tums, wouldn't drink milk, he's not foaming at the mouth, he's getting low-fat cream cheese in between the lettuce. But there's no vitamin D and low-fat cream cheese, so what to do? Well, they like to be outside because they make lots of vitamin D. So you know how industry rises to the occasion when the opportunity is there? You can go to your local pet shop and buy Reptisun that mimics sunlight for 40 bucks so that your pet reptile at home will make vitamin D in its skin. We don't do this for our nursing home residents, no, 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 but we do this for our pet iguanas, right? So there he is smirking at me because I just spent 40 bucks so he can make some vitamin D in his skin. So I have a happy daughter and a happy iguana, right? And you need calcium and vitamin D for strong bones and healthy teeth. And when you do that, both my daughter and her iguana grew very well. Fertile couple from Indonesia relocated to Washington, D.C. and had non-viable offspring. Major PR problem. And this was back when Nixon was president because Sukarno visited Nixon. There were no Komodo dragons in any zoo in the United States. And Zucarno came with a mated pair of Komodo dragons. And it turned out that they had non-viable hatchlings. Why? I happened to be in Washington, D.C. at a scientific meeting, and a good friend of mine, a nutritionist at the National Zoo, called me over. He said, Halleck, you're an endocrinologist. Maybe they have a hormone problem. Well, I said, yeah, they have a hormone problem, that kind you're thinking about. They are not exposed to any vitamin D-producing rays. They're in a glass enclosure. All vitamin D-producing rays are absorbed by the glass. I said, I'll bet you they're vitamin D deficient. How do you determine that? Very carefully, right? And indeed, we did, how do you treat them? And you do that equally carefully. And when you do that, and we proved the point that you couldn't make any vitamin D in the cage, that when we gave them the vitamin D, all of the hatchlings hatched. And so now many zoos in the United States have lots of Komodo dragons. And so what's the message here? Did you know vitamin D deficiency is associated with infertility for both males and females? low birth weight, and poor birth outcomes. And so I'm an unusual consultant, because I consult for many zoos in the United States, because this continues to be a health issue. This is the problem. You assume you're having a healthy diet, you're getting all the vitamin D that you need. But even when we looked at a national health survey for children, middle-aged, and older adults, no one in the United States can get enough vitamin D from dietary sources, period. Yes, there's vitamin D in milk, about 100 units in a serving. So if you follow the Institute of Medicine's advice, you would drink six glasses of milk a day to get 600 units of vitamin D. Why is he carrying this mushroom? Because the mushroom industry realizes something, a great marketing tool. They make vitamin D. And sure enough, we've shown not only do they make vitamin D2, but they make vitamin D3 as well as even vitamin D4. And so the mushroom industry now, you can go to your local produce section and buy UV exposed mushrooms that contain vitamin D. But back in the 40s and 50s, we didn't have to worry about this because Kish is the lineup for cod liver oil, right? Because it tasted so good. We don't do this anymore, right? And we know it comes in tablet and oil and emulsion. And you've heard from Dr. Brown, I'm a little bit controversial on my stance of sensible sun exposure. So I'm constantly interviewed by the press, but then they talk to dermatologists. They said, don't listen to this guy, Holic. You just have to eat more fish. Why don't you have to eat? It's not a pretty sight, right? <laughs> Indeed, I go sail fishing with my son's catch release program in Guatemala. They don't have any the gorgeous fish. And these, uh, but oily fish, salmon, mackerel, herring, how much do you have to eat? You'd have to eat it every day. There's only 500 to 1,000 units in a serving. But that's not the question to ask. The question we asked a couple of years ago was wild versus farm salmon. What do you think the difference is? We found farm salmon essentially have no vitamin D. It's only wild caught salmon. This is where you get your vitamin D from, believe it or not. It's casual or not so casual exposure to sunlight. It provides us with our vitamin D requirement. You're out there feeling great in the summertime, making lots of vitamin D. But what about in the wintertime? This is the reason only 0.1% of the vitamin D producing UVB ever reaches the Earth's surface at the equator at noon in the summertime. 
right? So any alteration in the angle of the sun will absorb the, those rays. The ozone layer will absorb those rays, making it difficult to make vitamin D. So if you look, review the meteorologic literature, you get an insight to the problem. It says the bozone layer shields the rest of the solar system from Earth's harmful effects. In the summertime, the sun is coming directly through, you're making vitamin D. But now with winter coming, right, you wear more clothing, sun's rays are weaker, and they're going through a lot more ozone. Can you make any at all? So I got one of my students to go up on the roof of our institution in the middle of the month on a cloudless day to measure how much vitamin D you're making. And we showed in Boston, spring, summer, and fall, you make vitamin D. In the wintertime, you cannot make any at all. Now, my colleague said, you know what, Holly? We've got evidence-based medicine now in this new era of, of uh, clinical research. And so you got to prove the point. So I went back to my students. I said, look, I need a volunteer. Go up on the roof and prove to people in the wintertime, you're exposed to sunlight, you can't make any vitamin D. So after a lot of hemming and hawing, I finally got a volunteer. <laughs> Tell you what, you make no vitamin D in the winter in Boston. My daughter had a better part of this up at Middlebury College. If you go down to Miami for spring break, you can make it year round. But guess at what latitude you cannot make any vitamin D in your skin from November through February if you live above Atlanta, Georgia. Right, so it's not far in northern United States. Now you've been taught this by the dermatologists in particular. Go out in the early morning, late afternoon, go jogging, make your vitamin D. I'll tell you what, it's great for romance, but you make no vitamin D. <laughs> only from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. for exactly the same reason. The zenith angle of the sun is too oblique. All the vitamin D producing rays are being absorbed by the ozone layer. So this is what we've been taught about the sun. And there's no question, excessive exposure to sunlight will damage your skin and increased risk for non-melanoma skin cancer. Easy to detect and easy to treat. And so, of course, came the sunscreen industry, right? But guess what? The same radiation that causes sunburning is the same radiation that makes vitamin D. So obviously, what if you put a sunscreen on? How much is it going to reduce your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by? So we took some healthy adults and exposed them in our tanning bed up in our clinical research unit and showed that SPF of 30 reduces your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by about 97%. Not rocket science. You're exposed to sunlight, you make vitamin D. SPF of 30 absorbs about 97%, so therefore you're making 1% to 3% vitamin D in your skin. 90 to 95% of your vitamin D is coming from sun exposure. How much? Never want to burn. Can't look like this. And coming from New England, of course, you can't look like that, right? And so early in evolution, we knew exactly how long to stay outside and go back into the shade, but we lost that sun stat mechanism probably about 10,000 years ago. So how do you really know when you make enough vitamin D? See, these little poppies are the pop Eddie Bell button. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> so we did a study. And we took some healthy adults, put them in our tanning bed in our clinical research unit, and gave them an oral dose of vitamin D. And so it's like taking what we call a minimal erythemal dose, a light pinkness to your skin 24 hours later, is equivalent to ingesting about 20,000 units of vitamin D. So your skin has a huge capacity to make vitamin D. Does it really provide you with your vitamin D requirement? Here even in Denmark, no matter what your ethnicity, peak blood levels are always at the end of the summer, the nadir is always at the end of the winter. So Mr. Burns here, he's heard that aging may affect vitamin D synthesis. In fact, yeah, he's right, because we published this in Lancet in 1989, 75% reduction in a 70-year-old compared to a 20-year-old. So he's wondering, can you make any at all? Well, we took out some old biddies, wheeled them on a veranda, and exposed them to sunlight and showed, you better believe it. Your skin has such a huge capacity, even elders are able to make vitamin D in their skin. Now, I'm not sure what he's thinking about, but I'll tell you what he should have been thinking about. He should have been thinking about, does the skin pigment affect his vitamin D synthesis? Indeed, we showed many years ago that if you compare Pele to his girlfriend, that Pele needs to be exposed to four to 10 times more sun exposure to make the same amount of vitamin D as his friend. And that's why Morgan should be concerned. We know that African Americans are at much higher risk for vitamin D deficiency, and we think that the health disparity for increased risk for deadly cancers and infectious diseases, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, is in part due to their chronic vitamin D deficiency. Now, I'm always asked this question, how much sun should we get? I don't recommend this, tan, rotatan, right? Indeed, what you really want is sensible sun exposure. What does that mean? If you know you're going to get a mild pinkness to your skin about 30 minutes later out on Cape Cod in June at noontime, 5 to 15 minutes, arms, legs, abdomen, and back, followed by good sun protection, just like what she's doing here. 
take advantage of the beneficial effect of the sun, then put the sunscreen on, prevent the damaging effects from excessive exposure. Now, you ever wonder what she was really screaming about? It's amazing but true. If you go on the internet, they say, you cannot bathe when you go outside in the sun for at least four hours. I wouldn't want to be around anyone four hours later after they've been sunbathing because they said you were going to wash it off. Well, guess what? Your vitamin D, we showed, is made in the actively growing layers of your epidermis. You cannot wash it off. So when you're out in the sun, you can quickly go back in and get nice and clean. You wonder what he was trying to say? He was trying to say obesity is associated with vitamin D deficiency. Even Barney's amazed to hear, did you know vitamin D is associated with vitamin D deficiency? We showed many years ago, if you take a normal weight and an obese individual, either put them in our tanning bed up in our clinical research unit or give them an oral dose of vitamin D, they only raise their blood level by 45%. Well, evidence-based medicine, how do you know it's there? So we went to our local bariatric surgeon and our wonderful uh, nutritionists in our endocrine section, Carol, Carolyn Povian, and we asked the patient, I need a gram of your fat. Oh, don't worry, doc, we certainly got some fat. Bottom line is this, obese people need two up to five times more vitamin D to both treat and prevent vitamin D deficiency. So why so much interest in vitamin D, you may wonder? Well. Number of publications each year. Look at this. From 1962, all of a sudden, a meteoric rise. 12, 2012, 3,600 publications. Over this period of time, 33,000 publications just in the field of vitamin D. It is the most popular vitamin, at least in the scientific literature. And the Institute of Medicine in 2010 came together, and they looked at what is the true recommendations for the population at large. And they concluded that, wow, you know what? Before 2010, it was recommended everyone just needed 200 units of vitamin D a day. That was it. They realized, no, 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 you actually need three times more, 600 units a day. And more importantly, they realized that it's not toxic and that 2,000 units easily could be increased to 4,000 units a day and not worry about toxicity. But did they get it right? Right? And it turns out that in June of 2011, the Endocrine Practice Guidelines Committee came out with its recommendations. And yes, I chaired that committee, and all of the members are experts just in the field of vitamin D, unlike uh, the members of the Institute of Medicine. The objective was clear, to evaluate, treat, and prevent vitamin D deficiency for the care of patients. The Institute of Medicine had a different intention not intended for physicians, up to professional associations to make those recommendations, and they used a population model, not a medical model, for their recommendations. So it's not a surprise that the Endocrine Society would make different recommendations. In fact, we recommend all neonates, 400 to 1,000 units, because how can you just recommend 400 units? How are you gonna tell a new mom to give your infant exactly 400 units, especially if there's 400 units in a drop and she drops a dropper and a half? She thinks, oh my God, am I gonna kill my baby, right? And so children, one to 18, 600 to 1,000 units a day. And adults, a recommendation, 1,500 to 2,000 units a day. And if you're obese, two to three times more. So what is she thinking about? Well, I'll tell you what you should be thinking about. Who is at risk? And I hope we convince you, yeah, everyone is. Indeed, he's worried about global warming. No, no, no. What is the big deal about vitamin D deficiency? Because really, rickus is the tip of the iceberg. Because a painful bone disease that I'll talk about in a moment diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, infectious diseases, hypertension, heart disease, common cancers have all been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Now, I made one I was smoking last night. There's actually good science to back up all of these. In fact, Discover Magazine in 1997 concluded of the top 100 medical breakthroughs, number eight came in, can vitamin D save your life? Time Magazine, same year, 10 biggest medical breakthroughs, more benefits of vitamin D. Now, you always like to publish New England Journal of Medicine and Nature to get really a lot of um, press and whatnot. No, no, no. Fitness magazine is where you want to publish the super vitamin. And if you want to get your teenager's attention, there's only one place to publish, Teen Vogue, right? The Sunny Vitamin D. But what's the message here? The message is that the docs weren't getting it. It was the lay press picking up on all these 33,000 publications and putting it out in the press. The patient would go to the doctor and say, please get my blood level of 25-hydroxy-D. And the doctor said, no. Why would I want to do that? 
It's expensive. You have a healthy diet. You can't be vitamin D deficient. Crazy. But patient persists. Finally, the doc gets it. And now the doc's got religion, finds that the patient's vitamin D deficient. And now the doc's ordering on older patients. The assay for 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which I helped to pioneer back in the um, 1980s and 90s um, with Dr. Belsey at Mass General Hospital, is the most ordered assay by doctors in the United States. One in nine Australians now have a blood level drawn for 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Is vitamin D deficiency a health issue? With all the modern medicine, you would think, good grief, we would have cured this. So I did a study and showed that in Boston, 84% of African Americans at the end of the summer were vitamin D deficient. 30% of Caucasians at the end of the summer, vitamin D deficient. It's an epidemic in adults over the age of 50. What about young adults? Many of you in the audience never see the light of day, right? Our medical students and residents, 32% deficient, taking a multivitamin, eating probably salmon once a week and a couple of glasses of milk a day. White girls in Bangor, Maine, they were taking a multivitamin, two glasses of milk a day, 600 units a day, 48% deficient. Off to summer camp, wearing sun protection all the time, 17% came back, vitamin D deficient. Right here, millions of children affected at a children's hospital, they showed adolescent boys and girls, 42% of Bostonians, vitamin D deficient. Right. Look at this, even the CDC looked throughout the entire United States and concluded 32% of children and adults, vitamin D deficient. If you choose 30 as the cutoff, which is what the Endocrine Society recommends, and you look at the National Health Survey, six to 11 years of age children, 70% deficient or insufficient. One to five years of age, 50% deficient or insufficient. Globally, it's an issue. United States, even Australia, Worldwide, up to 63% of the population deficient or insufficient. Vitamin D deficiency will precipitate and exacerbate osteoporosis, which of course is a silent disease. Basically, holes in your bones does not cause bone pain. But osteomalacia is a little bit different. It is not so silent. In fact, usually it happens in the wintertime. Curiously, your aches and pains in your bones and muscles always occur in the winter. I wonder why. Well, it could be because Generalized bone pain, isolated bone pain, muscle aches and pains, which the nouveau diagnosis is fibromyalgia, is often vitamin D deficiency osteomalacia. Indeed, Mayo Clinic proceedings, 150 children and adults presenting with aches and pains in their bones and muscles, 93% vitamin D deficient. Also, they looked, 23-year-old female shows up in the emergency department, non-radicular pain, lumbar pain, weakness, fatigue, the doc puts down dysthymia, the patient doesn't know what that means, being depressed, and said is sent home. Asian female, same thing. This black male, he lucks out, he's put on narcotics, sent home. They were all <laughs> vitamin D deficient. So why do you get pain when you get osteomalacia? I know you all learned this in high school. It's what's called a jello phenomenon, right? You take jello, you put it in Do you know what makes a little girl happy? Twinkling jello. There's nothing quite like jello. No question about it. It's great stuff, but it's not great underneath your periosteal covering, which is heavily innervated with sensory fibers. If it gets hydrated, it's pushing upward. Patients complain of throbbing, aching bone pain. They're laying down, and they complain of bone pain. They have a normal workup by the rheumatologist, and as a result, they're often written out off as being depressed. And so I typically recommend for physicians to press with thumb and forefinger on the breastbone or on the lower leg. If the patient winces in pain, it's a classic sign for osteomalacia. 78-year-old male, he shows up to his doctor with muscle weakness, atrophy, denervation, positive EMG, nerve conduction study for ALS. Turns out he was treated for vitamin D deficiency as well. All symptoms resolved because it's known. Progressive painless muscle weakness with muscle atrophy that manifests like lower motor neuron disease improves after vitamin D supplementation. He's constantly complaining to his dog about aches and pains in his bones and muscles. Dog's fed up with him, told him, stupid, you're vitamin D deficient. <laughs> right? He didn't have to worry about using steroids because we know why Superman got his strength when he was on planet Earth because you have a vitamin D receptor in your skeletal muscle. You could not make enough vitamin D on Krypton. I knew that Dr. Brown was going to be introducing me, so I decided to go on the internet to look at him up as a child. And even as a child, he knew you need the vitamin D for good muscle strength. 
And so we did a study at uh, a nursing home in Boston and showed that just giving nursing home residents 800 units a day, 72% reduced risk of falling. If you gave them two, four, or 600 units a day in a double-blind placebo-controlled manner, no benefit. So that's why we want everybody to be above 30, increase your bone density, reduce risk of fractures, improve muscle function, less likely to fall, less likely to fracture. How do you treat vitamin D deficiency? Well, that's a problem, because the doctors used to say, well, I'll take a couple of multivitamins. Well, you can't do that. A, you're gonna choke on these things. And B, is you're gonna get too much vitamin A. Right, you only can take one. Your tank is on empty, you get a gallon of gas. You might now because it costs so much, but in the past you fill it up. When your tank is on empty, you wanna fill it, and your vitamin D tank is on empty. So I treat the patients with 50,000 units of vitamin D once a week for eight weeks. It's equivalent to 6,000 units a day. So the docs are beginning to do this. And then after the eight weeks, they put them on 1,000 units or 400 units of vitamin D. They come back six months later deficient again. Why? They didn't correct the problem. They weren't getting enough. So to prevent this from happening, it's a nice little gelatin capsule, and often patients have some kind of GI issue. I'll tell them just to cut it in half, dump the oil, a little bit of milk, and drink it, and it works quite well, is I put them on 50,000 units every two weeks forever, 3,000 units a day. Now, you may argue, because vitamin D is not soluble, it's going to build up in your body fat over time and cause toxicity maybe four or five years later, because all you're doing is a study maybe for a couple of months. And so Einstein, he worried about this as well. So we looked at our data for six years and showed after six years on 3,000 units a day, all the patients were doing perfectly fine and in a healthy range for their 25-hydroxy-D. Now why is his hair on end? Because he heard something, which is amazing. I'm recommending vitamin D2. Now why am I recommending vitamin D2? Because it predates the FDA. And so, as a result, the FDA said you can use it as a pharmaceutical. Nobody ever wanted to get the approval for vitamin D3. So vitamin D3 is not available as a pharmaceutical. And it's been stated in literature that it's only 30% as effective as vitamin D3. So why are you going to use it? Well, when you have a problem like this, R2D2 heard about this. He didn't think it was any different than C3PO. And so is really D3 any different than D2? So who would you go to when you really have a problem like this? There's only one group, right? Mythbusters. And so we did a study, and we gave healthy adults at our medical school 1,000 units of D2 or 1,000 units of D3. Placebo, D2, D3, no difference. But the argument is that D2 increases the destruction of D3. And so we looked at the group that got D2, there was no difference. But what's the message here? The message is, we were giving healthy medical students 1,000 units of vitamin D a day for several months. Essentially, no one became sufficient. We know 1,000 units a day will not make you sufficient during the wintertime. I gotta say, this one is totally busted. Totally, it's busted. Got it? Right. And so it turns out, when I give these talks, especially the docs in the audience, what they remember more from medical school than anything else, don't ever make your patient vitamin D intoxicated. They've never seen vitamin D intoxication. They don't know what vitamin D intoxication is, but 50,000 units sounds like it's gonna cause vitamin D intoxication, right? We did a study and showed up to 10,000 units a day to healthy adults is perfectly safe. Now my son, he's now a lawyer, but when he was becoming a lawyer, I went on the internet to get these little goodies to kind of keep him on a straight and narrow path. And it says here, it's kind of chilly, throwing a lawyer on the fire, right? And so I get a phone call, seven o'clock one morning from a lawyer in Florida. And he said, are you Dr. Hollick? I said, no. <laughs> Why would I want to talk to a lawyer at seven o'clock in the morning? He said, I know you're Hollick because you're the only one there at seven o'clock in the morning. I said, okay, he said, I'm gonna sue you. I said, why? This is back in the early 90s, because I had been recommending back then 2,000 units a day, potentially to reduce risk of prostate cancer. And so he followed my advice. But if you, in the early 90s, went to a local drugstore, you could not find a vitamin D supplement on the shelf. So he went on the internet. And what he did was he bought Prolongevity. It had 1,000 units in a teaspoon. He thought that was great. And so he was taking two teaspoons a day for six months, and he was intoxicated. So he's going to sue me. I said, look, before you sue me, send us stuff up, we'll do an analysis for you. We did. The company forgot to dilute it. He was taking pure crystalline vitamin D and a million units a day. This will cause vitamin D intoxication. We published them in the New England Journal of Medicine. It counts at 15, 12 drugs a day of 500. It is difficult to become vitamin D intoxicated. 72-year-old woman is caring for her 96-year-old mom and presents with fatigue at the Brigham. She was found to have hypercalcemia, workup ruled out cancer. She was vitamin D intoxicated. 
Was she taking too much vitamin D? No, because they went to her house, they looked everywhere. They couldn't find any vitamin D. Two weeks later, one-year-old child presents with hypercalcemia at Children's Hospital. They call me up. They said, what do you think? I said, I had not a clue. Cause for the deintoxication? Didn't know. So we decided to write to all the doctors in the Boston area and ask the question, have you seen any unusual cases of hypercalcemia? And yes, eight came back. And guess what? We asked them then, are they eating a lot of salmon? Are they taking megavitamins? Are they out in the sun a lot? And it turned out that none of it was true. But we did ask another question. If you're drinking milk, where are you drinking it from? And it turned out all eight patients, including the 72-year-old female, was drinking milk from all natural and fortified with vitamin D, mom and pop, from Crescent Ridge and Sharon, Massachusetts. And so, and they delivered right to your doorstep, which is really great. So we went out and we bought a bottle. And we brought it back and we did an analysis. And the label said 400 units in a quart. And we came back with 250,000 units. <laughs> but not only that, it was curious. They said it's D2. We found it was D3. So I went back to my postdoc. I said, look, you must have contaminated it because we're working with lots of vitamin D in our lab. I can't very well indict this um, dairy for vitamin D intoxication if it turns out that we contaminated the milk. So we did it again, and it came back exactly the same. And so I called up the Department of Public Health, and I said, I think you have a problem. And they said, Hollick, we have a lot of problems. <laughs> he said, it's a vitamin. I said, look, if you don't do something about this, I'm going to call a press conference tomorrow morning because I think that this is a major health issue. And I hear from them. So I come home, and Sally is listening to the TV, WBZ, and it says, breaking news. It says, DPH found toxic levels of vitamin D in a local dairy. That was a surprise to me. <laughs> and so we finally were able to shut the dairy down. And happily, what the dairy did now was it took vitamin D out of milk. So actually, now we told people to go back to the dairy to buy the milk because it was the only milk anywhere on the shelf that didn't have any vitamin D. So now I get a phone call, 10 o'clock Friday night, woken up, and who's calling me? But, and by the way, it turns out that the supplier sold more vitamin D concentrate to the Crescent Ridge Dairy, so what they didn't know what to do with it, right? There was a janitor that was dumping the vitamin D in the milk, right? And so he bought all this stuff because he was getting a kickback. And so he had it under his desk, so he decided to open them up and to dump it in the milk. And so 44,000 consumers were at risk for vitamin D intoxication, right? And so the rest of the story, the vitamin D manufacturer ran out of labels for vitamin D3, but they had labels for vitamin D2. So they figured, what the hell, it's vitamin D. So they just put on the label vitamin D2. So now, 10 o'clock at night Friday, I get a phone call from who? The CDC. They said they're flying up because I heard about this intoxication problem. And they wanted all our records. They assured me that we would be working with you carefully. Never heard from them again. <laughs> and then I got a phone call from my friends over at the Brigham, because we were collaborating together. And they said, you know what? New England Journal just called us. And the CDC just submitted a paper saying that they uncovered vitamin D intoxication in the local dairy in Sharon, Massachusetts. Surprise to me. And so we immediately put our paper together, submitted it, and of course published two papers back to back in 1992 and 93. All right, why should you care about this story? Well, because we were born and we evolved in sunlight, and like I said, you're activating vitamin D. And yes, it's important for calcium metabolism. And though yes, you would expect, therefore, the vitamin D receptor to be in your kidneys, in your bones, and in your intestine, because that's where vitamin D is supposed to work. But now researchers are beginning to find that every tissue and cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor. So why would they be there? Well, it turns out that the first observations were by Dr. Suda, right? The postdoc in Hector DeLuca's lab when I was there back in the early 70s. He showed leukemic cells that had a vitamin D receptor. If you incubated them with active vitamin D, they became normal. And so now, in 1975, how can you translate basic science into medicine? And so it turns out, can 125D be used to treat a hyperproliferative disorder, right? Because it was treating cancer. And I, of course, all these different tissues had the vitamin D receptor, but so did the skin. And I wanted to know, could you 
somehow affect the proliferation of skin cells. So we took some skin cells, working with Dr. Belbert Gilchrist, and showed activated vitamin D markedly improved their health and markedly decreased proliferation and induced maturation. So putting my MD hat back on, I asked a question. Could you use it for anything? What is the most common hyperproliferative skin disorder that's not malignant? Psoriasis. And so sure enough, psoriasis is that the skin cells are multiplying 10 times faster than normal. So why not topically apply active vitamin D? That seemed to make sense, right? So is it useful for psoriasis? Holic, how are you going to formulate it? Well, it's down really great, and we can chemically make the 125D, but I had not a clue how to formulate it. We don't teach, they don't teach you that in medical school. So I was looking in the lab, and I saw Vaseline. Hmm. I thought, it's kind of lipid-soluble. 125D is lipid-soluble. Maybe we could get it together. But how do you put it in there? Well, what you do is you cook it. And if you heat it up to 50 degrees and you make it into a liquid, you dump it in, mix it around. I called up the FDA. They said, how do you get to prove that it's not toxic? Well, back then, the FDA was pretty you know, kind of relaxed. So I, I, I took some rats, I gave them some vitamin D topically, called them up 24 hours later, I said, they didn't die. They said, fine. <laughs> and so they let me do the study. And so we did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. But I went to my dermatology friends. And of course, I'm this idiot talking about sun exposure, right? And they're talking about sunscreen. And I'm talking now about psoriasis is their bread and butter. And I'm telling them that active vitamin D is going to treat psoriasis. So they said, don't call us, we'll call you. So just like the Mikey commercial, right? right? Mikey, if he likes it, you know, mom won't, if he doesn't like it, mom won't let us have to eat it, right, for his, his older brothers. Well, that's what the dermatologists did. They decided, give Holic the worst patients. They aren't responding to anything. It won't work. It'll leave us alone. All right, so this guy had not really had any significant treatment for psoriasis. So I gave him two tubes in a double-blind and placebo-controlled fashion, and he came back two months later. I'm not a dermatologist, but it looked to me like there may have been a response. And then we even did a biopsies and looked. So this is the placebo, and this is the group that received the active form of vitamin D. Indeed, it turned out that, look, scalp psoriasis before and after. I treated over 600 patients with active vitamin D that we made in the test tube. 92% improved. So what do you do when you have really exciting results? Only one place to go, New England Journal of Medicine. So we submitted it, and of course it was rejected. So I knew I was on the right path, <laughs> right? And so I now am writing to the dermatology community trying to get them to understand that we made a major discovery in psoriasis. And so I went to the American Academy of Dermatology to try to get a poster presentation or to give an oral presentation. So they finally decided to get rid of me, to put me on Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock, when nobody was in the room. But the Boston Globe reporter was there. I guess he had nothing better to do. And so he said to me, would you like as a human interest story for us to publish your data in, in, our, in the Globe? And I said, sure. So it says, help for psoriasis. Call Holic. That's when I was at Tufts University. Well, it turns out that I started getting lots of phone calls. And I didn't get only in the Globe, Boston Globe, but I got in the Globe. And here, JFK killer, next to the dynasty, was new hope for psoriasis, Carl Holland. <laughs> so not to look a gift horse in the mouth, we put on an answering machine. And I wound up in the Enquirer. Next to the crazed knife man was breakthrough for psoriasis, <laughs> Carl Holland. And so we got 20,000 people wrote to me about psoriasis wanting to participate in my project. I had the largest psoriasis patient population probably of any dermatologist in the United States. So I tell my students, you know, they always worry about publishing New England Journal and JBMR and Nature and Science. No, no, no. What you really want to publish is publishing, Globe, Inquire, and Star, <laughs> right? And so Dovinex is one of the active metabolites. It turns out active vitamin D is first-line therapy for psoriasis. So my good friend, Dr. Barbara Gilchrist, was so impressed with the work that she nominated me for the Psoriasis Research Award back in the year 2004, uh, 2000, uh, and gave it to me um, at that uh, meeting. So what about the rest of the story and cancer? It turns out that there's a lot of evidence linking vitamin D deficiency and sunlight deficiency with cancer. The first study done in 1915, people working indoors compared to Navy personnel working outdoors had an eight times higher risk of dying of cancer. Also, sunbathing could cut your risk of cancer. It was observed in 1941. If you live in the Northeast, you are more likely to die of cancer than if you live down South. Why? 
Apparently thought at the time that maybe a cancer is a cancer, and that if you get skin cancer, which is easy to detect and easy to treat, that you would build up an immunity to all other cancers. That was his concept. The Garland brothers in the uh, 90s started be giving and looking at data and showing just 1,000 units of vitamin D a day, projected 50% reduced risk of colorectal cancer. A study at the Nurses' Health Study here at Harvard showed nurses that had the highest blood levels of 25 hydroxy D, 50% lower risk of developing breast cancer. A study done in Nebraska showed women just taking 1,100 units of vitamin D a day for four years, reduced risk of all cancer 60%. Right? A study done in Canada showed that young women having the most sun exposure as teenagers and young adults later in life reduced risk of getting breast cancer by almost 70%. Possible connection. Well, it made sense, kind of, right? You make a lot of vitamin D in your skin, you ingest a lot of vitamin D, your kidneys are pumping out a lot of active vitamin D, and as a result, reduce risk of cancer. Well, not so, because yes, it does inhibit cancer cell growth, but your kidneys will not make a lot of activated, activated vitamin D, just like those chickens, right? And so that was a real conundrum. And it turned out in the 90s, we and others began to think about, what about other cells in the body activating vitamin D locally? They would then regulate a whole host of genes and then destroy itself, so you never saw it in the bloodstream. Sure enough, up to 2,000 genes are believed to be directly or indirectly regulated by 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. What about the immune system? We've always known activated macrophages activate vitamin D. Why do these dumb macrophages do that? know why. 1849, color oil and TB. Macrophages, when you're infecting uh, a macrophage with TB, toll-like receptors are turned on, tells the cell to activate vitamin D to make a protein, cathalocytin, that specifically kills infective agents. That's probably why solariums were so effective and may have been the missing link for treating TB. In fact, Finson was using it to treat skin TB with ultraviolet light, and he wound up getting the Nobel Prize in 1903 for that discovery. So local production of vitamin D is very important for innate immunity. Always the flu season occurs at the winter time, right? It was thought that there's a seasonal stimulus. Always at the time of the peak flu season is at the time when your blood level of 20 hydroxy D is at its lowest. A study done out of Yale showed that if you increase your vitamin D intake, that it's likely that you could reduce risk of upper respiratory tract infections twofold. A study done in Japanese school children getting 1,200 units of vitamin D a day reduced risk of, relative risk of um, influenza A infection 42%. Also, a study done in Finland, children during the first year of life in the 1960s getting 2,000 units of vitamin D a day followed for 31 years, reduced risk of type 1 diabetes 88%. Look at this. Even in Finland, they begin to worry about vitamin D toxicity, so they continue to decrease it to 400 units a day for infants. Look at the incidence of type 1 diabetes on the rise. Also, we know that if you increase your calcium and vitamin D intake from the National Health Survey, 33% reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. The magical latitude of about Atlanta, Georgia, if you live there for the first 10 years of your life, 100% increased risk of developing MS. A study out of the Nurses' Health Study out of Harvard showed Nurses that had the highest intake of vitamin D reduced risk of MS, 41%. Rheumatoid arthritis, 44%. And David Felsen showed from the Framingham Heart Study, osteoarthritis is associated with vitamin D deficiency. Also, peripheral vascular disease from the National Health Survey showed 80% reduced risk, that magical number above 30. Congestive heart failure has been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Mechanism, blood pressure control, atherosclerotic, uh, reduction as well as myocardial function controlled in some way, in part, by 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Even the Framingham Heart Study showed if you're vitamin D deficient, 50% higher risk of having a heart attack. Optimal level is 30, and it was shown, if that doesn't get your attention, this might, that reduced risk of mortality, 25%, just improving your vitamin D status. What about other evidence for immune function? We did a study two years ago and showed in healthy adults where we gave for 12 weeks 2,000 units of vitamin D a day and broad gene expression analysis 
with Avi Spira. All these genes in blue are not working. All these genes in red are on hyperdrive. Just giving vitamin D, all these genes were being turned off, and all of these, uh, these were being turned on, and these were being turned off. We identified 291 genes affecting 80 different metabolic pathways related just by improving your vitamin D status. Feed your genes right with vitamin D, right? Adequate vitamin D is critically important from birth until death. Vitamin D deficiency is a disease of neglect. There's a mound of evidence linking it to these chronic illnesses. Don't think about a normal level, but a healthy level, right? Everybody we wish to be above this level, just like they are here, Maasai warriors in Africa, 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. Look at this, disease burden and vitamin D deficiency, low birth weight, stunted growth, type two diabetes, hypertension, fracture, cancer, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases. How do you increase your vitamin D intake? For every 100 units you ingest, you only raise your blood level by one. And that's why, if you're in this range, and I guarantee that you are, if you're not on two to 3,000 units a day, 1,000 units a day will not make you sufficient, right? That's why I recommend adults, 2,000 units a day, children, 1,000 units a day, make it simple. Conquer D deficiency, best source, bond bread back in the 30s, you didn't want your kids naked outside every day, eat vitamin D fortified bond bread. I know that Young adults would not be D deficient today if we we're still doing this, but back in the 30s, Schlitz beer was fortified with vitamin D. Keep sunny energy all winter long, drink vitamin D fortified Schlitz beer. I went on eBay and bought a can. <laughs> Look, Shadi, a spot of sunshine playing to get your vitamin D. 1953 New Yorker, right? Always known about the beneficial effects of the sun. So you realize by now I'm a proponent of sensible sun exposure. How do you get the message out to the public? In 2004, I wrote the first book. And first page, I do not advocate tanning, right? And in fact, I point out, no question, just like Dr. Brown pointed out, excessive exposure to sunlight increases risk for non-melanoma skin cancer. But everybody worries about melanoma. Indeed, guess what? Did you know that most melanomas occur on the least sun exposed areas? And guess what? Occupational sun exposure actually decreases melanoma risk. There are the data. Lifetime sun exposure is associated with a lower risk of malignant melanoma. Journal of Investigative Dermatology, 2003. Ancestors' view is a little bit different than a dermatologist's view of the sun. No question about it. Indeed, dermatologists advising you about sun protection, always wear it. Have you ever been on rounds with an unenlightened dermatologist? the kinder, gentler view in life, and Schultz epitomizes this in his peanuts character. Here, Linus getting up from his mom. Are you sitting in the sun? I hope so. A little sun is good, as long as we don't overdo it. Perhaps 10 minutes a day, this time of the year is about right. He was right on target. Right? No question about it, right? This is what's happened to our sun. It's been demonized for more than 40 years unchallenged. Slip, slop, slop message in Australia. Guess who this is? That's an Australian dermatologist on vacation, and they measured their vitamin D status. 87% were vitamin D deficient at the end of the summer. Right? Have you ever wondered about this? Nothing can stop that now. You know what it couldn't stop? Look, you were right. You were right about me. You know what he was right about? Yeah, it's associated with Dementia, right? Indeed, it's associated with schizophrenia, dementia, and depression, right? You've been taught this. You can get it from your diet. I hopefully have convinced you that you cannot. Well, actually, I apologize. There is one source, especially with Halloween just passing. There's one group out there that we are particularly concerned about, right? Because they never see the light of day. <laughs> and so we wondered, bats. Where do bats get their vitamin D from? Well, who are you gonna to go to when you really wanna know about bats? There's only one person, right? Tom Coons, who's a BU Batman, right? And so he gave me Liz Southworth, his graduate student, and went to various caves throughout Puerto Rico and collected blood. So these bats upside down, they're dark, dark black, right? Exposed to sunlight all the time. What about bats that eat fish only at night? Turns out, fruit-eating bats, about 24 nanograms per ml, right? But fish-eating bats, 245 nanograms per ml. But that's not the bat I cared about. I wanted to know about this bat, 
because they eat one half of their body weight and blood every day. They're sucking up all this 25-doxy vitamin D. What are they doing with it? Well, I'll tell you what they do with it. They keep it because they're 255 nanograms per ml. So I tell my unenlightened dermatology friends, there is another source of vitamin D if you wish. <laughs> right? You cannot get it from your diet, right? So what do I do? I'm asked this question all the time. Best source is sunlight. But like I said, the vagaries of cloudy day, time of day, season of the year, degree of skin pigmentation, right? So what about an app? So working with a uh, software engineer in California, we've developed an app, dminer.info. The 30 years of data I've collected around the world, we've put all together with his uh, expertise. And you can now, anywhere on the globe, any time of the year, go into this app, and we'll tell you how many units of vitamin D you're making. And we also tell you to get out of the sun because you're going to be exposed to too much sunlight and damage your skin. And so I, like all my family members, sunscreen on face, but not on arms and legs. And I, like all my family members, total of about 3,000 units a day, blood level about 56 nanograms per ml. So Holly, anything new on the horizon, right? Nobody's ever happy about what you did yesterday. So what about a personal vitamin D producing device? Well, it turns out it's a major issue, especially for cystic fibrosis kids, right? I have a breathing problem and bone problems. I can't absorb vitamin D. Can you help? Right? 10 million children and adults are at risk of vitamin D deficiency because of a variety of fat malabsorption syndromes, including inflammatory bowel disease. So we need a simple vitamin D producing device. So where to go? Well, the first study we did was in a patient with Crohn's disease. She had two feet of her intestine left. Her major problem was bone pain. Of everything that she complained about, throbbing, aching bone pain, she could not sleep. And so what to do? Tanning bed to the rescue. And our clinical research unit put her in there three times a week for three months. She was free of her bone pain. So back in the 40s, you could go to your local drugstore and buy this spurty lamp for about $5, you would expose your child at home, prevent rickets. The Spurdy group has now redesigned it, but you can see, you have to plug it in, it gets hot, and depending upon the distance from it, make a little or a lot of vitamin D. Not very effective. And so, but it does work in cystic fibrosis patients, which we showed very nicely. And so, is there a more efficient, friendlier way to produce vitamin D? Well, no question about it. The BU Innovator of the Year, Ted Moustakas, who's here in the audience today, got the chance to meet him. And he's one of the originators of many of the LED systems that are out there. So why not develop a personalized LED device? Can it make vitamin D efficiently? That's the question. And so I had a several high school students, because there's a very nice research internship science and engineering program here called RISS. And sure enough, here's one of them. And he helped to design just to show what this kind of personalized device could look like. Exposed these skin samples to this UVB LED and showed very nicely that just after three to five minutes, efficiently made vitamin D. So I would anticipate within maybe five years, if everything could go well, and uh, working with Ray Vio, that maybe we can develop a personalized device that you can go to the local drugstore and wrap around your abdomen or whatever, especially for malabsorption patients, and make vitamin D. It's 10 times more efficient to make vitamin D in your skin. He's been very clever, Dr. Moustakas, in increasing the efficiency of the LED output. So Dr. Holly. Vitamin D deficiency is the most common medical condition worldwide. If any one of these chronic illnesses I've talked about turn out to be associated with vitamin D deficiency, there is no downside to increasing your vitamin D intake. You don't need to be a genius to know this, right? We need vitamin D supplement recommendations and good sensible sun exposure. It is not a hypothesis, right? Written a new book recently, and sure enough, practice Guidelines, just like the Endocrine Society recommends, 400 to 1,000 for neonates, 600 for, to 1,000 for children, 1,500 to 2,000 for adults. If you're obese, you need more. I've had many, many students, postdocs, going through my laboratory. This is just a few of them. And also, my laboratory today, including the RISE students that I had this past summer, I am most grateful for their continued support. And I'm most thankful to my uh, wonderful children and my lovely wife, Sally Ann, who's been supportive for me for 40 years, and I'm most grateful to. And I thank you for your kind attention.
think we have I think we have time for uh, several questions. There are microphones here. If um, there are questions in the audience, please. If uh, humans make vitamin D through exposure to the sunlight, how do mammals that have fur make vitamin D? Right, so it turns out curiously, studies have been done in cats. Cats cannot make any vitamin D. They have no 70 hydrocholesterol in their skin, so they totally get it from their diet. But cows, for example, um, can get it from some of those areas that are not completely covered. We did a study in chickens. We wanted to know where chickens made it. The concept in the 1930s was that chicken, the preen gland near the anal area, they would secrete this oil that contained the pro-vitamin D. They'd be exposed to sunlight, and as they were cleaning themselves, they would ingest the vitamin D. Well, that made no sense. And I had a bunch of hungry graduate students. So I said, look, let's buy some chickens. Let's pluck them. Let's extract the um, oil. Let's extract the feathers and look at the different areas of the skin. Guess what? Only the legs and comb had 10 times higher concentrations of 70 hydro cholesterol compared to back skin. So in fact, Mother Nature cleverly has designed the system so in various areas where sun exposure occurs, these animals can make vitamin D, or if they're carnivores, they'll get it from their diet. Yeah, I know a stage four prostate cancer uh, patient who's been taking uh, with bony meds who's been taking 20,000 units a day. I think his uh, overall levels are around 80. Would it be advisable to go beyond that 20,000? Or you can't say, or what? Yeah, it's really hard to say. I mean, we recommend up to 100 is perfectly safe, but we know that toxicity. Per day? No, 100 uh, nanograms per ml. Oh, yeah, yeah. And okay. so you could take a little bit more, maybe 25,000 units. Uh -huh. But you need to monitor carefully your urinary calcium right. as well as your serum calcium right. and your 25-hydroxy vitamin D. There's a group actually in Brazil that's treating MS patients with 50,000 units a day. They put them on a low calcium diet. He follows them very carefully for their blood calcium, their 24-hour urine calcium. And patients that have lesions in their brain that are blind have been have almost miraculously have had dramatic improvement in their symptoms. I was down there recently and visited with these patients and I was truly amazed. So no, no problem with hypercalcemia. But you need to watch your calcium very carefully and make sure that you don't develop hypercalciuria, lots of calcium in your urine because you can increase your risk of kidney stones. Okay. Whether it'll make any difference, I can't promise, but it can't hurt. I have just one curiosity that you said that colored people, they synthesize less vitamin D. You showed the data about that. Do you think it's, it's something to do with their pigmentation? Right. There's no question that your melanin pigmentation is an incredibly efficient sunscreen. So it will efficiently absorb ultraviolet B radiation. So I'm often asked, well, you know, are you really certain about all this? If you think about this evolutionarily, if you look at the at African American blacks that are blue black, right, they have and permit probably about a tenth of a percent of the UVB to get in for them to make vitamin D. And as I showed, that there are studies to show that Africans outside every day have robust levels of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. So our skin pigment was actually designed perfectly for where we live latitudinally, but we are so you know, mobile that no longer is that the case. Um, my question was, uh, you usually talked about units per day, but it sounds like we can store it. Sometimes you say we get in the summer and not the winter. So how many, what would be, um, how many units per month or how many units per year, and can we just get it all at once and store, and how long does it, can we keep it? Yep, so it's a good question. And it turns out vitamin D is very forgiving because it has to go to your liver and your kidney before it gets activated. And yes, vitamin D is stored in your body fat. We think that what happened early in evolution, our hunter-gatherer forefathers, especially in Europe, even here in northern United States, we're outside every day making vitamin D in the spring, summer, and fall, storing in our body fat. They use their body fat as an energy source, release the vitamin D so it never became vitamin D deficient. But now if you're obese, it's a different story. You're at much higher risk. And so we think that uh, probably you could take vitamin D once a day. You could take all of it once a week. You could take all of it as long as it's on a daily basis. So 3,000 units a day, for example, is 50,000 units every two weeks. 
and even once a month, 100,000 units will work quite well. Oh, I think you've kind of gotten to my question, which was, um, what is it about obesity that dulls the effects of vitamin D? Yeah, we're not completely sure. We, we did a very nice study with Dr. Susan Fried's group. It showed that the uh, adipocyte and pre-adipocyte have vitamin D receptor. We think that they metabolize vitamin D. We think they utilize vitamin D. We think that they cause maturation of fat cells. So there's a lot of things going on probably in fat cells that vitamin D is doing separate from the fact that vitamin D is stored in body fat. Thank you. Wonderful lecture. I wanted to know what advice you would give for, to younger people who are entering vitamin D research. Say it again. Younger people who are interested in doing vitamin D research. Yep. For young people interested in vitamin D research, probably need the vitamin D, find a vitamin D laboratory um, and to you know, have them be encouraging in terms of helping to promote a career in vitamin D. It's a really hot topic these days, and, and there's a lot to yet be done in the field to better understand its health benefits. The last two questions, so we'll hear again. Uh, I've been taking 50,000 IUs of D3 daily for the last year, and I've been taking 10,000 for the last 10 years daily. Um, 10,000 didn't touch my rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, 50,000 has got rid of it. Uh, I've run over 60,000 miles, and I'm running again, lifting weights again. It's, uh, I'd like to see some more large-scale studies done on uh, some decent uh, therapeutic doses um, as opposed to 1,000 and 2,000, which I think is uh, totally uh, inadequate. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, the study done in Brazil certainly is kind of an eye-opener. And as long as you're careful and making sure that you're not causing toxicity, there's no reason you know, not to be thinking about doing placebo-controlled trials to well, see what, what the effect is. What does mean with uh, D3? From what I understand, they basically tell people to stop taking it, drink more water, and go home. You don't end up in an ICU. Yeah. You don't so, end up in a hospital. Right. So, so just quickly, because it turns out that before 1950, hot dogs, custard, everything was fortified with vitamin D throughout the world, throughout Europe. In 1950, there was an outbreak, they thought an outbreak, where they had some infants that had funny faces, had high blood calcium, had supervalvular aortic stenosis, and mental retardation. And so they went to the local legislative body and they passed laws forbidding any fortification of foods with vitamin D. Why? Because the experts concluded that rodents, pregnant rodents that got high doses of vitamin D had pups that were, had funny faces, had supervalvular aortic stenosis, and hypercalcemia. They couldn't figure out if they were mentally retarded. It turns out that they didn't know that it was milk containing vitamin D. It turns out that they had a rare genetic disorder called Williams syndrome. But on the books today is still that concept. So doctors have been taught all along throughout medical school, healthcare professionals, vitamin D is one of the most toxic fat soluble vitamins. It turns out that it is not. You mentioned that uh, 1,500 to 2,000 I use is recommended a day and a serum level of 30. Is there any data for the general population to suggest that maybe you, um, someone should take 4,000 to 5,000 units or aim for higher serum levels than 30? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the recommendation from the Endocrine Society is that you want to get your blood level 40 to 60, and the reason is that there's a variety of commercial assays out there, and there's so, there's so much vagary in the assay to be guaranteed you're sufficient 40 to 60. The problem is that you have to be very careful. You can't be taking too much vitamin D, but there is toxicity, increased risk for cardiovascular calcification, kidney stones, kidney failure, and ultimately death. So you do need to be careful. I do not recommend massive doses of vitamin D. I follow my patients carefully, but 3,000 units a day is perfectly safe. Even the Institute of Medicine said 4,000 units a day is perfectly safe. Let's join and thank Dr. Hollick again for a wonderful lecture. This is true for memory. This is something for life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.